What's up, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of the Professional Athlete Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ken Gunter, and I am really excited about today's episode. We are bringing you a whole lot of zen. We are joined today by Dr. Greg Carton. Greg's a sports psychologist, and he's the founder of GC3 Performance Consulting out of Belmont, Massachusetts. He provides sports psychology consulting, and he works for professional and amateur athletes, Um, but today he's doing the bulk of his work with professional golfers on the PGA and web.com tours. He's also the new performance columnist for Golf Magazine. You can find him on golf.com, where he provides feedback to readers who are looking for help with their mental game. And uh, man, I cannot stress enough how great of a conversation this was. I think for anyone who's trying to perform at work, athletically, in your personal life, the mental game is probably the most important and and probably often the most underrated piece of what you're doing. And he specializes in nothing other than, you know, helping these guys who are performing at an extremely high level under extremely high degrees of stress, you know, work through their their, their mental game, deal with the negative self-talk, get rid of, not get rid of nerves, but learn to become comfortable with nerves. So it, it was just a fantastic conversation. I think uh, hopefully for all the listeners, no matter what you're doing in your walk of life, this is going to be helpful. But also if you have young kids who are starting to get into athletics, I think this is really crucial for them to understand that, you know, even the heroes uh, in the sporting world that they look up to are dealing with the same negative self-talk that they probably are. So hopefully it's reassuring. Uh, With that, don't forget to stick around after the conversation where I put together my key takeaways and I run it by my wife, Sonia Gunter. The early feedback is that this is actually the best part of the show. So saying that out loud, I'm actually not sure what that says about my solo sections, but uh, I will take what I can get at this point. And on that note, let us know what you think of the show. Really appreciate all those who've reached out to us and given feedback either on iTunes uh, or on Instagram or to me directly. Um, So if you would be so kind, leave us a review so others can find out about the show. Um, Unless you have something negative to say, just keep that to yourself or maybe write that down on a piece of paper and just shove it in your desk drawer. But uh, yeah, let us know what you think. We really appreciate the feedback. If you want to follow us, we're going to be giving updates about the show on Instagram, where our handle is the underscore professional athlete. We're going to be giving early feedback, promoting upcoming guests, showing some behind the scenes footage, going to give you a little insight into my training. Uh, there might also be some shirtless picks that make their way in there. So depending on what you're into, that could be fun. Uh, We're also in the process of building out a website to support. So uh, some of the early feedback was love the conversation. Where can I get more information? We're going to try and build that out as well. But uh, right now we're a small team, so it's going to take a little time, but we promise to get that up and running. And so with the shameless self-promotion over, let's welcome Greg to the show. And here we go. Too much to do. Yeah, I gotta get going. I gotta talk to you. It's time to start the show. <laughs> First and foremost, man, thanks, thanks for joining today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I've I've just recently got, became aware of kind of the work that you do uh, in the arena of golf. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, at a high level, kind of hearing what you're doing, it just seems so applicable, not only to sport, but just to life more broadly. Yeah, that's, I hear that a lot as well from my clients that, oh, this is great from a performance perspective, but, you know, I'm having things going on, you know, I've got kids now and I got all these things I got to balance and I'm all over the place and I'm having trouble sort of settling down and, and this work has really helped in all aspects of my life. And, you know, sport is even at the highest level performance, it's important to work there, but a lot of the issues that happen on the course or a court or a rink, uh, don't come from there. They come from somewhere else. So yeah, that a little bit too. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, so like I was saying before we started, I'm actually, so I, I work in sales mm-hmm. 
So, you know, yes, I have a day job, but uh, my most like impactful interactions are spent basically presenting. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I was a college athlete, played football mm -hmm. and it's interesting, like going into like a high stress sales meeting, it kind of kicks on a lot oh, of yeah. those same like emotions and uh, anxieties that, you know, I, I used to maybe get playing. So, yeah, I work for a company and we do a lot of uh, performance work with strictly sales people. That's it. That's all. We oh, okay. So, it, and it's all, it's easy, meaning it's all the same stuff. It, there's no right. difference. It, it's all the performance based stuff of sort of slowing down and, and not paying too close attention to what you're thinking and, and being focused on what you're engaged in is it, it's all the same, whether you're in sales or playing golf. Yeah. So when you begin working with like one of your clients, mm -hmm. right. Um, you know, where, where do you kind of start? Mm -hmm. Um, I learned a long time ago in school about, uh, building relationships and how important that is mm -hmm. because there's a lot of good people in our field who do good work, but if you don't trust who you're talking to, none of it matters. So yeah. there's times where I've met with clients three, four, five times even before we really get into, you know, why they showed up. It's building that relationship right. that's really important. So, you know, the first session or two is either by phone or in person somewhere, maybe not my office, you know, getting some coffee, mm -hmm. getting a sense of, you know, why they're there, what they're looking for, some of their objectives, um, giving them a sense of sort of how I work. And I pride myself on remaining quite flexible. Everyone's a little bit different. Some people love to meet for an hour a week, uh, once yeah. a week at a specific time. Others like to have my number and reach out whenever they want. So right. everyone's a little bit different. And I really take that uh, into consideration. But yeah, it, it's it's a slow process in the beginning, I think, getting to know somebody. It's, it's But it's also the most important piece. Well, and I'd have to think too, you know, what, what people are coming to you for, right? It's like intensely personal. Exactly. And it's, it's confidential. It's personal. They've right. maybe, they've never talked to anybody about this before in their lives. Yep. Um, and I'm a stranger. So, sure. you know, again, that, that, that adds to that, how important it is to really build that rapport, build that trust, because without it, you have nothing. And that's the same with any relationship. Uh, I think even, you know, work with a lot of golf coaches and they're the same, you know, mm. There's tons of good coaches who have a lot of good information, but if who they're working with doesn't trust them or doesn't right. have a relationship with them, then it doesn't matter what they say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, like you were saying before we started, you you work with golfers um, kind of across all levels, mm -hmm. but how I, how I came to find out about you was the work that you're doing with folks um, on the PGA and, and, and the web.com tours. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, what is it about the sport of golf that kind of uh, drew you right in, sure. into that environment? So about halfway through my graduate work, I made a shift in my focus. Uh, my advisor was very much interested in mindfulness and Eastern philosophy. And at the time, the two hadn't merged yet. It, it wasn't a part of performance enhancement work yet. Okay. And I'd also had my own meditation practice since I was in high school and was always interested in that aspect and, and realized that, wow, this would have, this could really help a lot of people in the performance yeah. world instead of the more traditional work of, you know, goal setting or visualization or right. positive thinking. And, um, and in golf, what, what's interesting is one, you initiate everything, right? You don't, you're not responding to someone pitching to you or you're not you know, yeah. playing in a fast sport like hockey or soccer, where you're just constantly reacting to what other people are doing. You initiate yeah. everything. In addition, you have all the time in the world to think. <laughs> and as I said before, for, for nothing, worse. nothing, well, you, it, it, it's, it's 99.9% .9 of the time. It's worse. It's right. never do you sit with your thoughts and something good creeps in. It's always <laughs> something bad. And the more time we spend living in those moments and believing what we're thinking, the, the harder it is to, to perform. And yeah. all athletes have that sensation of getting in their own way, right? And that's what that is. It's, it's having a thought, thinking you need to do something with it. And before you know it, you're not engaged with what you're doing. You're engaged in what you're thinking. And that can right. cause a major problem when it comes to performance. And yeah. so I say to you know, the athletes I work with all the time, I'm in the skill uh, access 
work, right? Like you need to access the skill you've already learned and not skill acquisition, but skill access. So you develop a skill. Yeah. Now you're competing. How do you access that skill? Well, you get out of your own way. Mm. Yeah. So that's interesting. And it's funny. I'm just thinking back last night, I was recording an intro for a, a previous podcast and my wife was sitting in here watching me do it. And like, I mean, just talking by yourself, mm -hmm. it's completely unnatural. Right. Right. And so like, you know, whatever, whatever someone ends up hearing is probably like my fourth or fifth attempt at right. it. And, uh, my wife was just listening to the way I talk to myself. You know, I'd sure. start to stumble and be like, and you're an idiot starting over now. You know yeah. what I mean? She's like, what are you doing? That is terrible. My guess is you she never talk does to it also else. though, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> we exactly. all do. She was like, finally, we agree. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right, right. So, so that's, that's an interesting uh, kind of idea that I'd love to get your take on this idea of controlling thought, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, what's, what's your perspective? Yeah. I mean, so we're all under this assumption that you have to think a certain way to play well. Like you have to yeah. have a positive mindset. You have to be thinking good thoughts all the time. Um, if a negative thought arises, you need to get rid of it immediately. You have to change mm -hmm. it or block it out, which is the one we hear all the time. Right. Right. All the time. All really, you know, the, the intention is right in those messages, but I don't know anybody that's been able to do that ever <laughs> in the history of <laughs> mankind. I don't know anyone that's been able to block out thoughts or to control what they think. Well, and I've, I find too, and you can tell me cause you got, you work with guys at the highest level. I find that often some of the best athletes that I've ever encountered, mm -hmm have have the most critical self-talk sure. yeah oh yeah absolutely and and, and nobody's di different and nobody's immune from that type of thinking and yeah. it's really reassuring for the kids i work with to let them know that hey what you're thinking it, it sounds crazy but the tour pros think the same way right 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 and so this idea that okay now i'm going to go out there and i'm going to stand on the first tee and i'm going to have all these positive thoughts flow in, and i'm just going to be free and that game sounds pretty easy well, right. you get out there and everyone knows what happens. They start to see where the trouble is. Human yeah. beings uh, have a, what we call a negative bias, right? We've had to, for survival purposes, know where the danger was. So mm. uh, it's built into our DNA to focus on what's wrong. There's nothing wrong with that until you think there's something wrong with that. So standing uh. on the first tee and thinking about the water that's down the left side and reminding yourself that good players must not think that way and something must be wrong with me and I can't think positive. And this is before you hit the first shot. Yeah, now you're already in a battle with yourself. It, and it continues Oops. and it only gets worse, right? Right. So there's a couple bad things that happen when we think that we're supposed to think that way. One is we create a ton of resistance, to what's okay. real. What's real is whatever you're thinking or doing in that moment. And the resistance causes mm -hmm. tension. The second piece is you start to judge yourself. And that too causes a lot of tension. I'm weak. I can't play this game. I can't think like the best players in the world. I'll never be good at this game. Right. So this is, that was a long winded answer to why controlling no, thought can be quite problematic. And, and so is there, I mean, is there any validity then to the idea that you can control thought? Because I feel like what I'm hearing is, look, you, you can tell yourself you're going to block out all the negative thoughts. Yeah, well, but yeah, there's no need to block it out. It, it's a, so that's yeah. the next layer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a reason why positive thoughts get a good reputation and bad thoughts are considered bad and detrimental. Mm -hmm. When you're standing on the first, and I'll use golf as an example, and I hope that's okay, or when you're, when you're oh, standing please, somewhere I mean, and you're flooded with good thoughts – out right. of nowhere, right? Because that's where thought sort of comes from out of nowhere. We don't control that. Right. Um, we don't do anything. We, they feel good. We sit there and we just continue on and engage with the activity we have in front of us. So using yeah. golf, we just swing. Right. If we have a bad thought, uh, the warning signals go off. I have to change this. You create tension, you create some resistance, you create some judgment, all because of a thought. Hmm. It's not real. In the end, in my opinion, the content of our thinking doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. They're just, it's both, they're both just thoughts. You yeah. can get to a point where instead of having to block out negative thoughts, you can just simply observe them just like you would a good thought. Hmm. With the understanding that thoughts don't hit these golf shots. But if I want to put myself in the best position to succeed, I need to be free. And to be free, I can't be fighting myself. So you mentioned earlier 
that uh, you know a lot of this for you was, or, and stop me if any of this is incorrect, if or if I understood incorrectly, um, you know, it was kind of meditation, mm-hmm. right? Was kind of like one of your foundational principles that kind of like gave birth to this consultancy that you do now, right? Yes, um, I had a background indirect in meditation in meditation from a teacher that I worked with in high school who was exposed to some of these ideas and, and helped mm. us form practice. So this was well before I knew what I wanted to do um, for a living. It just occurred to me when I was in grad school and I had an advisor who was also very much interested in more uh, what we call positive psychology or acceptance-based models um, yeah. of not fighting ourselves anymore and, and, and learning how to observe thought and, and to see through it and to re-engage with what's real and, and what's real like i said before is what we're facing right now not not our thoughts our thoughts are not real right yeah and so it's so i've, I've dabbled mm-hmm. with meditation yeah. i'm not going to pretend that i <laughs> by anywhere uh you know ready to be a a, yogi, oh, yeah, right. you know. <laughs> a buddhist um, monk Right. But, but one of the kind of the exercises, um, that I found to be interesting is like this idea of not trying to block thought, right. Right. But acknowledging it Mm -hmm. and kind of just like letting it go. Is that, does that fall in line with kind of like what you describe to your guys or like, is it, you know, how how do you have your guys deal with, you know, Hey, the reality is you are going to get negative thought at times where you're asked to perform at a high level. You know, how, how are you telling your guys to deal with those instances? Yeah, I mean, th- that's the idea if you were to boil it down, this idea that mm. you don't need to do anything anymore with your thinking. And for, yeah. uh, for a lot of athletes, that's liberating right off the bat. Wow, I've, yeah. I've always thought I had to think a certain way to play well. Hmm. And I always ask my athletes, when you've played your best, what were you thinking about? And what did you do special that day? And the unanimous answer is, I don't know. Yet we try (laughs) to create this mindset of, you know, this positive mindset to play well. When in reality, the sensation or or the feeling that we derive from playing well is is freedom of not knowing and of thinking nothing. So, and again, we don't think nothing, but it's the idea that the thoughts don't register. Hmm. Right. So you can observe thought. And again, even the most well-practiced Buddhist monks sometimes get stuck in thought. So Mm -hmm. don't judge yourself while you're on this journey. And and it's only, you know, moments here and there of not fighting ourselves to help create a little bit more, more freedom. It's not all or nothing. And I think a lot of people who, and I, and I steer clear of mentioning meditation because a lot of, at the beginning, we can, at least, we'll, we'll, edit, we'll edit that out. What's that? No, no, no. But the no, no. In terms of <laughs> with, with with clients, because yeah. some people get afraid. Well, I've tried to meditate and I I couldn't do it, which makes mm-hmm. no sense. There, there's no. And that. it might have a, a stigma around it. Yeah, there's a stigma in, attached. You know, it's, incorrect, incorrectly so. Exactly. It's very passive. I, I'm more of a tough guy, and I I want you know I want to do mm-hmm. something different. But yeah, there's no wrong way to meditate. Meditate is simply observing whatever Mm. it is you're thinking so that over time you start to distance yourself a little bit more from the need to respond to everything we think. Mm -hmm. And you also allow yourself to sit with discomfort for a little bit longer. And the more time we do that, the less fear it invokes. So the reason, another reason why we don't like to have negative thoughts is because it causes discomfort. And as a human, I'll ask you, when you get sick, what do you do? When I get sick, yeah, you take medicine or try to make yourself feel better. Right. When you get cold, yeah, exactly. what do you do? Right. Put on no, a jacket. Exactly. You get hungry. You eat. We're always trying to re- remain take some comfortable. Action. Yeah. yeah. So when we yeah. have negative thoughts, what do we do? Well, I got to change it. I got to. I can't feel this way. I got to do something. And they're getting a lot of the tapping yep. subconsciously. And why yeah. meditation can be such a powerful skill. Right. So yeah, just the the, the ability to actually just be comfortable with just observation like you were exactly saying. so there's nothing wrong with fighting yourself when you have negative thoughts right that causes judgment mm. too but starting to learn about how we can um, render them powerless through observation and, and acceptance can be really liberating for athletes but it, it, it's hard work the hardest thing for yeah. a human being to do is to do nothing in those situations yeah. and that's that's so, what you're doing yeah and so how you know 
athletics so many times is like boiled down to like sets and reps and drills. And, you know, do you have any sort of practice that you have your clients go through to kind of become better equipped at just observing the thought and not trying to sure. fight it and create this anxiety? Yeah. And that, that's where the skill, I guess, comes in from what I do and trying to find mm. activities or exercise or explanations that'll work for some people. Yeah. Um, you, you know, the, cause I have to imagine it's like, like to your saying, right? Like we, we've spent our whole life operating in this way totally. and, and, to change the way that you think is like no small feat. Exactly. And it, it's not so much changing the way you think it's changing your understanding of what your thoughts mean. Ah, okay. Right? That's important. So it is, it's a small distinction, but it, it can be important because I can never tell somebody what to think. I can mm. also never tell somebody how to think. It's not, I don't have that power. Nobody does. But helping yeah. people understand the meaning of thought and where it comes from and why we do certain things can really help to unravel some of the, that getting in our own way sensation. So in essence, it's, you can go out there and play and think anything you want and feel anything you want and still perform on a very high level. Yeah. It's not the other way around. It's not, you have to go think a certain way and then you'll play well. Right. So a, a really common and, and powerful metaphor um, for thought observation that I got from uh, a couple of practitioners a, a long time ago was this idea of a parade. Like there's two ways to watch a parade. You can sit hmm. in one spot and watch each float as it comes on in and comes into our awareness and then it moves on slowly. Yeah. Or yeah. you can follow one float that you like and run through the crowd and be miserable and fight and, and try to stay with that one float the whole way. Yeah. So the more Eastern approach would be to just sort of observe it all, come and go without responding yeah. or needing to do anything and move on to the next. Because thought comes and goes. It only We only hold it in place when we try to fight it or resist it. Hmm. But if you were to sit and meditate and just watch what you thought, and I do this exercise uh, sometimes during talks, I'll have people for five minutes write down everything that comes into your mind. That's yeah. it. That's all you're going to do. And first of all, everyone's papers look pretty much the same. It, it's crazy, right? What, what we think. Yeah. And that's how our minds work. They're constantly, thoughts are coming and going. When we stop to try to fight or think we need to think a different way, that's when we cause problems for ourselves. Yeah. And, and so what are the problems that kind of come from trying to fight thought? You know, like how, how does it manifest itself uh, for your golfers, yeah. you know, in like a high stress, high performance situation. Sure. So from, from a performance perspective, it's just this resistance, right? Mm. The resistance to I'm, I don't like how I feel. I wish I felt like somebody else. And that resistance causes tension and yeah. golfers know what swinging with tension and swinging with freedom, you know, knows the difference. It doesn't take a whole lot to derail a swing. Right. Right. And a lot of that comes from our resistance to thinking we should be thinking a different way or I should feel a different way than I am right now. And, um, and then trying to create that, trying to create, oh, yesterday I played great. Let me try to create how I felt yesterday. Yeah. That's a resistance to this moment as well. You're living in the oh, past. Oh, interesting. So it's why hmm. athletes have trouble sometimes following up really good rounds because instead of engaging with the moment at, at hand, they're trying to create something that's already trying happened. To replicate. That's right. Yeah, the feelings let's and experience keep this they going. had. In that pre right, let's right. do what I and did yesterday. When they're not in that, yeah, it's kind of like then you're creating that tension. because like, oh, man, why don't I feel like I did that's right. yesterday? And you can break that down even within rounds. Oh, I got I made six birdies in mm. a row. It's really difficult to keep that going because now you're trying to make a birdie instead of trying to engage with what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So. No, it's funny. I, um... I threw javelin in my senior year in high school mm -hmm. and I remember the harder I tried, right? And of, of course, like there's all this self-talk going on, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't until I realized to just completely relax right. that I finally started having good throws. And, and the best throw I ever had in my life came on a throw where I felt like I didn't do anything. There you go. So I always say to people that, that people pay me money to tell them to do nothing. <laughs> and, and it, but it's the hardest thing to do as, as an athlete. It's this idea of trying yeah. not to try, it's a, which is a title of a great book. Um, oh, okay. How do we get to a point where, um, like you just described, mm -hmm. you don't do it by trying to do it. 
Right. <laughs> right. It's so counterintuitive. It, it is. And this idea that the zone is a really popular sort of phrase uh, yeah. in sport and performance. Nobody's been able to create a zone sensation. They just right. occur. And the more we try yeah. to create it, the farther away we get. So creating That's or recreating or holding things in place or avoiding, these are the things that we need to avoid. Yeah. Right. No, that makes sense. And like you so said, you, it's very counterintuitive. It is. And I think, you know, myself, uh, a lot of athletes out there, a lot of people who are, are really trying to perform at a high level mm -hmm. in their day jobs at home, whatever. Um, you know, so many people similarly, I think, like if there's a problem, they want to try and fix it. Probably. Right. Immediately. And it, yeah, it, right. And it's like well-intended, sure. you know, and that's probably why like you're having success in different areas of your life to begin with. Um, so to your point, right. To, to try and like come to acceptance with the fact that like the best thing you can do is just do nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it almost kind of feels like, ah, like I, I just want to be able to like try and, you know what I mean? Pull some lever or change, change some action. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I don't remember where this is. Um, mathematicians, when they are faced yeah. with a really difficult problem to solve and they are having trouble figuring it out. Don't grind away and try to figure it out. They put it away for a week and come right. back to it. Yeah. Golfers are the worst when it comes to this. The shot mm. goes a little bit offline. There's an immediate fix. You can visually see it. They, they mm -hmm. check in their hands. They're doing this. Um, working with a player right now who's competing out uh, in L.A. and is, was really struggling. And mm -hmm. his challenge for yesterday was to do nothing. And be aware of when you sense this idea that you need to change something. Yeah. Can, you, can you develop enough trust in yourself that you've developed enough skill to compete at a high level? It may be covered mm. up. And the more you try to search for it, the more, the farther away you're going to get. So yeah. his only challenge was not to play well, but to be aware of when he was searching. And he played all right. Mm. Yeah, just acknowledge those moments where yeah. that habit of – you know, whatever that self-talk is, just, it, yeah. I, am I correct? And it's like, Hey, just acknowledge when that starts happening. And That's all you can do because a lot of this happens subconsciously. Right. Once you bring it into consciousness, you have no power anymore. It's just sort of yeah. there. Yeah. And that's, that's the idea. But again, these things aren't very tangible. So a lot of athletes have struggled with this, right? Athletes want results immediate and something to, you know, do. So it can be a tough sell and, again, gets back to this idea of, um, there's a lot of good people who do what we do and everyone's a little bit different in their approach. I, I don't know if this would work for everyone necessarily if they didn't buy into yeah. it. So finding that, you know, right match right. is really important. So is there any credence to the idea of positive thought? Only in my ex belief, because you don't do anything when you have positive thoughts. Huh. That's why they feel good. They, yeah. they promote freedom because we don't fight them. We allow them mm. to just be there. But I've never, there's no study anywhere that says thoughts hit golf shots or thoughts cause us to do things. I love that. And, and yeah, I, no, you're right. Be great thought, if it thought did. has never hit a shot. No. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's what we choose to do in, in one having those thoughts that, that does. So positive mm. thoughts will always be preferred. But I don't know because another athlete don't. that I, you can't tell someone to go out and think positive all day long. Right. And it sounds like the reason positive thoughts, um, not that, not that they're bad, but they don't, they probably don't cause that same form of resistance subconsciously no. or consciously. No, no that we give good, negative. Right? Yeah. So you, you, then you probably naturally stay a little looser. You're able to just kind of be more in the moment with the task at hand. Yeah. yeah. They don't, they don't, yeah. they don't get in the way. Hmm. How do you approach the idea of nerves, right? So in golf, it's an extreme example, right? I mean, there's a lot of money on the line. Yeah. There's a lot of eyes and it's, it's, you know, a highly precise movement, mm. um, where, I mean, literally it's, it's a game of inches, you know, but I mean, for someone like myself, like there's times where I have a big meeting, either it's with someone who's really important at a potential client, yep. or maybe it's a certain time of the year and like, Hey man, this deal could really make my quarter. It could really make my, sure. you know, like, and you, you can't help but kind of get that, that nervousness. Of course. Um, 
how do you how do you approach that with your clients? So, and I, I wouldn't go through this exercise with you. What do nerves represent? Mm. Where do they come from? I think for me, the nerves probably come more from a fear of not going to be able to perform when as I actually when it counts. But when it hasn't happened yet, right? Oh. Right now, you mean? Yeah. Or you mean like no. what, like usually when it happens? It's like right before. Right before, right. So the action hasn't happened yet. What yes, you're talking correct. about, what you're describing is a fear of uh, something that hasn't happened yet, something that's mm. in the future. So to right. me, what you're describing is you have a thought about what might go wrong. Right. A thought about something in the future that could go wrong. And because mm. we have zero control over that. Yeah. Right. We, we feel these nerves, like it, Eckhart Tolle calls this the anxiety gap. You project mm. into the future about something that might happen, a future that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. And because we have a negative bias, we never experience this idea of something really good happening. We have to really manufacture that, right? Mm -hmm. It's always, what if I do this? What if this goes wrong? What if this happens? Right. And because we have no control over that right now, we haven't gotten there yet, we get nervous. Yeah. That's what yeah. nerves are. Nerves are a product yeah. of our thinking. And getting back to what we just said before, if you had thoughts about really nailing a presentation, you wouldn't do anything. It would feel good. Oh, so I have to think this way. Mm. But the thoughts about what could go wrong are the same thing as the thoughts that could go right. They're just thoughts. Nothing's happened yet. Right. And if you blow that presentation, it never feels as bad as you think it would if you blow it. <laughs> That's so true. The anticipation is always worse. It's the same thing that the person yeah. is afraid to go to the doctor. They, they yeah. stew and they create so much anxiety and tension about what the doctor might say. And then they go to the doctor and they give them bad news. And in that moment, it doesn't feel half as bad as it did when they, when they thought it might be. Right. Our brains are crazy. So what, what, what is that? Yeah. Why, why is ant anticipation so much worse? Like what, what is it about our minds that like we build our it Our minds up? are very powerful. I mean, it's a simple answer, right? Yeah. But it's never as bad as we think it's going to be, even if it's the worst case scenario. Yeah. And nerves so all you, come, okay. or anticipation or anxiety, it's all the same deal. It comes from our thinking about mm -hmm. a future that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. About an activity that we have no control over because we're not there. Right. It's why it's a good idea, I think, to prepare <laughs> right? Yeah. Because, and that's another conversation we're going to do. I'm not a huge believer in preparation, but you can prepare to make yourself feel good, not necessarily to perform better, but hmm. to, to maybe eliminate some of the fear of what it might be like to not perform well. That's why people prepare. Yeah. I'm not a big believer in over preparation because I think preparing now for something that hasn't happened yet, we revert back to the past when we're presenting. Right. It's so funny you say that one of the best, uh, you know, he, he, I guess I could call him a friend, but one of the best sellers I've ever seen said basically the same thing, mm. right? So often we're drilled with a hey, preparation, preparation, yeah. practice, practice, practice. Uh, and he kind of was of the opinion is like, well, why? Right. He's like, I could, I could prepare for a full hour long presentation. And the moment I walk in that meeting, I get hit with a curveball question. Totally. And now everything that I've spent hours presenting is irrelevant That's exactly right golfers play practice rounds and they drill and they practice and they get to know the courses prior to events and then they show up on thursday morning for the first round and the weather's different the grass is a little bit different everything the wind's a little bit different mm -hmm. we prepare to feel good not to perform well yeah and that in itself is okay the best um yeah we're not we're not telling pro golfers to stop taking swings no 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 and, no, 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 no by <laughs> no means and it would never tell someone even if they did want to continue to prepare but right, just to right, provide right. a different perspective like the best yeah. George Mumford, uh, who is one of my mentors, is a, is a sports psychologist who um, has a deep Eastern philo philosophical approach. He worked mm. with Dr. J and Matt, uh, Michael Jordan and Phil Jack. You name it. Some pretty good, some pretty good totally. ball players. And and taught them meditation and mindfulness and, and he's local. He's in Boston. And oh, well, yeah. Phil Jackson. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Zen master. Right. right. So that a lot of his work came from George Mumford. So George mm. Mumford, the first time I saw him speak, he came to one of our grad classes and he sat there in the front row and he 
just sat there. He had no papers. He had nothing. And we all had our notes ready to take. And he just looked at us and he said, what's your name? And, and he engaged with people. And then all of a sudden, this huge discussion erupted. And it was the best yeah. talk. I get the most out of that talk. And, and that taught me something. And yeah. that's how I wanted to do. That's how I wanted to present. I don't want to right. present something that's prepared last week yep. to a group now. Mm-hmm. I want to be here and give them what I can give them right now. I think that's a really good perspective. I mean, we've all been in those brutal presentations right. where the slides are well manicured, everything's curated perfectly. Yeah. And they may, and they may reach a couple of people. Right. But And the information might be relevant. It might totally. It's helpful. There's, there's always utility. Sure. Um, but I get but, yeah, asked but to then, give talks at, at clubs sometimes, and, and I'll the first thing I say is I don't really give – presentations anymore i'm happy to come and talk to people yeah but there's nothing i'm going to present Mm -hmm. and no and i i think people appreciate that too right because at the end of the day what i've found is like you know whether or not someone's coming to a talk like people really want to be heard they want to be heard and they want to be part of it yes so totally agree while there's no organization and there's no it's you're getting a whole lot out of it and it's mm-hmm. in, so anyways, getting back to this idea of preparing and I don't know how we got on this, but yeah. that's my no, it's take good. and it's a different perspective. It's not the right perspective. It's, it's what fits for you. But, um, I get a lot of the similar responses that you just gave me. Oh yeah, you're right. I could go into all these talks and you know, some are okay, but most of them fall asleep. Right. There's no engagement. Exactly. There's no connection. Yeah. They could be good presentations, but there's still no connection. Right. So with that, you know, like, I'm sure your golfers still get nervous. Sure. So what, you know, not, uh, not for you to like give everything away here in one podcast, but I mean, so like when someone comes to you and they're like, Hey man, I just, I get so anxious bet- before these big shots. Yeah. Is it, is it really, and I don't want to say simple because I've already said like, <laughs> I can already begin to relate to like how hard it is to not let these negative thoughts um, that, you know, flood in, like start to have like some control over the way you're thinking and feeling. But, you know, what are simple things that, you know, professional golfer or professional corporate seller, you know what I mean? When they start feeling nervous, like how can they start to kind of like deal with some of those symptoms? So what you do in that situation is you, you lean into it a little bit more. You allow yourself Mm. to be anxious because it's the real tension and frustration um, that comes from anxiety is our resistance to the anxiety. If you allow yourself to feel like you can still play great golf and be anxious. Yeah. You ask any golfer that's come down the stretch and won a tournament, if they, how were they were feeling? They all say they were anxious. They were all, Mm. not all, but a big percentage of them do. They were yeah. nervous. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they they're all calm. human. Yeah, we're just human beings. That's exactly right. We're just human. Yeah. You can only do so much. Sure. But I can guarantee you one thing. If you're anxious, you can't do anything to not be anxious. Mm-hmm. But you also don't need to. And the more you sort of lean into that and allow yourself to feel it, you realize it's actually not that bad. I can be with this. It's not that bad. Yeah. That's the hardest thing to do, though, because it causes that discomfort. So subconsciously, we're, oh, my God, I can't feel this way. I got to do my deep breathing or I got to like visualize, I got to do something to change how I'm feeling. And these are extreme examples, but it, no, but I I'm mean, a believer that I, you I can might, play well and perform I, well and be anxious at the same time. Yeah. See, that's interesting. And that's so, I think probably in contrast to what people think great athletes are doing. Right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And, and that's where yeah. we get the kid that comes in the office and says, I want to be like Brooks Kepka. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not going to get you very far. One, you don't know what's going on in his head. It looks like sure. he's pretty calm and collected, and he, he may be. Yeah. But trying to be like somebody else is a total resistance to who you are. Mm-hmm. And that's where our problems come from. Again, we're talking about, in, especially with a sport like golf, it's the smallest fraction that you can't measure tension. But if you could, it's a fraction of tension that causes that could derail a golf swing. Oh, yeah. And, and any resistance to how we're thinking or feeling is going to do that. So, so it, it sounds like you have to accept the fact that if, if you're already getting anxious, you're going to get anxious in the future. Yeah. 
right? Like it's it we're we're not going to be able to like wipe the slate clean and completely change the way that you think. No, not in the moment, right? And 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 it, you don't need to. But the more time you go along spending moments in that discomfort, mm-hmm. the less you fear it, the less you're going to try to jump out of your skin. And over time, you almost develop a sensation that you're not anxious because mm. it's, you become accustomed to it. Right. Right. Yeah. Now th- there are physical yeah. responses that we have to anxiety. Right. We get our muscles tense up, we get sweaty, our heart rate increases. In other sports, yep. that's beneficial. Mm-hmm. It's not golf. It's not pitching in baseball. Yeah. Not, right. you know, so. Yeah. No, football, you know what I mean? There, there's, there's a benefit to getting there, your adrenaline really is. flowing right. and, and feeling like you can run through a brick wall. That's right. It, it golf, can, skill sports. Not, not so much. Not so much, yeah. So. You, you said something that is uh i've been thinking about it this idea that anxiety is it's fear of something that hasn't occurred yeah. yet yeah it comes from our right? thinking right and so now i'm i'm sitting here thinking like man how much time do i spend you know in an anxious state mm-hmm. and people listening to this are probably like god this guy's so goddamn anxious <laughs> like take, i'm not that anxious but yeah i get anxious um you know, and to me, tell me if I'm understanding this correctly, it, it really then becomes about not wasting effort and energy on things that haven't even occurred yet. It's about finding a way to become present in the moment. Yeah. So that you can perform. Yeah. And you only become present by recognizing when you're not. That That's awareness. Oh, man. It's... You just put me in a pretzel. <laughs> so... You can tell you can tell yourself to stay I'm present. Back, I'm back to square one. Right. I need we, we got to start all over. <laughs> you can tell yourself all you want. I'm going to go out tomorrow and, and be present all day. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be present, you need to recognize when you're not present. You need to develop awareness of what you're thinking about. And this this awareness skill is developed through meditation. Hmm. And this is and meditation doesn't again have to be. Legs crossed. No. Palms up. Yeah. Incense burning. Quiet. You can meditate right now. Just observe your thoughts. Yeah. Right? Huh. Meditation yeah. is And I don't I don't think we think about it in that way usually. No, because everyone wants to try to I accomplish don't. something when they meditate. I have to do it this way. I have to do it the right, right way. Meditation, again, the, the best metaphor I heard uh to describe meditation is from uh, Jack Cornfield, who who's uh uh, meditation teacher. He's, he's fantastic uh, author. And he, he says it's, it's the same thing as, as training a dog to stay a puppy, right? You put the dog okay. down, you watch it and what's it do? <laughs> it follows. Yeah. You. It gets up, moves, right? You recognize yeah. it, you go get yeah, it, yeah. you put it back. You right. do this a thousand times in one minute. That's meditation. Yeah. Recognizing, mm-hmm. being aware of when your mind wanders and coming back. Over yeah. and over again, you start to develop. Over time, the dog starts to stay. Right. Same with your mind. And so, do you find that the guys you work with, because um, I have to imagine some of you, like my buddy Mike, you worked with Mike for a little bit, five yeah, years? off and on, yeah. Yeah. Do you do you find that uh, this might be a leading question, but I'll ask it anyways. You know that your guys do build that muscle. You know. Yeah, I think what they learn over time is. And this comes from just consistent communication. Also, you start to develop a little bit more awareness. Right? Yeah. It's not possible to, to live moment to moment all the time. Like I mm-hmm. said before, even the most well-practiced Buddhist monks get caught in thought, get depressed, get anxious. So even that understanding sometimes is nice. Yeah. It's more the understanding that you can play well regardless. I think that's the idea. You can be yeah, caught that's in so thought. that's so interesting. And thought could be whatever, if you're observing and sort of not judging, thinking you should be thinking a different way, then you can create enough freedom to play well. Mm -hmm. The hard part with golf is you can do everything right and still not play well. (laughs) It's too hard of a game, but yeah. So, um, you know, thinking about trying to apply this to everyday life. So, I mean, people, people are distracted. Mm -hmm right? Name the arena that you're competing in, work, sports, maybe you're doing a CrossFit competition, you're doing a Spartan race, a marathon, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. right? Um, 
you know, the reality is like, we all have home lives. We have social lives. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Like I have a wife and three kids. Yeah. And I, I think you have the same, um, you know, how are you helping guys deal with not just thought as it pertains to like what they're trying to achieve in the moment, but like just the, the broader diverse distractions that kind of come with being a human in everyday life. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Just being more aware of those distractions and where they're coming from and can, especially if you have kids, like that's a good example. Like you want to be, when you're with them, you want to be with them. You don't want to be Uh, thinking about what you have to do for work tomorrow or what you're having for dinner. You just want to be present. And there's simple Mm -hmm. things to do. Put your phone down like that. That's an easy one. But even then it doesn't shut off the thinking. Right. Right. So you know, using the same skill, being aware of when you're uh, lost in thought about the paper or presentation you're doing tomorrow and return back to this moment over and over again. Mm. You know, so it's, it's all the same. It doesn't matter where you're using these skills. Yeah. Right? The skill is the same. It's the same idea. And I think, you know, I probably have a misconception. Maybe a lot of people do too. It's like, you know, everyone's heard like the anecdotal, like, Hey, when you start to get nervous, like, you know, breathe in and out for seven seconds right, each time right. or, or, or do X, Y, Z. Like, I guess I am almost like waiting for you to be like, Oh yeah. Like here's the thing that you should do. And you're like, no man, it's, uh, it's more about like over time, like you, you have to, it's this idea of like meditation. Yeah. It's and something you develop be, over time. It, like if you tell somebody yeah. to calm down, never goes it doesn't well. go well. It gets worse. Right. So now look, there are physiological responses we have to breathing, right? Like we, you can train yourself to breathe to where it calms your heart rate down. If that mm-hmm. works for you. I know people who have tried to control their breathing and get more anxious. The equivalent of right. if you were to walk and pay attention to your gait, you would probably trip. If you mm-hmm. start to tune into your breathing and control it without knowing what you're doing, you're probably going to, create a little bit more anxiety. It's going to seem very strange. So yeah. playing around with different ideas, but all comes back to the same idea that our, our, most of our struggles and suffering come from um, when we pay too close attention to what we're thinking and we try to respond to what we're thinking instead of what we're doing. Yeah. No, I, f- I feel like that uh, is something I can, I can certainly relate to. Yeah. I think most people, yeah. Yeah. I've never met someone so, who said, Oh, I have no problems doing that. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> right. Right. Um, you know, so, so with that, uh, we, we've, we've talked a little bit about the role of, of Eastern philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how, how are you incorporating that today in your practice with your athletes? Um, you know, we talked a little bit before about uh, presence, right. And being engaged in this moment, there, there's a great, one of my favorite psychologists named Ellen Langer, um, who has a much more Western approach to mindfulness and, and one okay. of her. And, t- and what would be the difference there? Sorry. It's the same just idea. It's just being paying attention to the present moment, right. Okay. Without judgment. Um, her thought, and this applies to athletes a lot is that, um, she talks about this idea of novel distinction, right? This mm. is how we remain present. We add something a little bit different to what we're doing. So we're not caught on autopilot all the time. And the example mm. I use, and she uses this idea of, I, I can guarantee you don't remember the last time you brushed your teeth, right? You wake right. up in the morning, you just brush your teeth, you just go. If you were to brush your teeth with the opposite hand, it becomes a brand new activity. You're much more engaged in that activity. Yeah. So we talk about preparation, right? In sport, sometimes you can prepare to the point where you become these, uh, you, you go on autopilot, right? Golfers are always yep. preach this pre-shot routine, make every shot the same. And they go out there and we've created these robots who can't take in any outside information because they're so programmed. Mm. So adding yeah. something a little different to your routine can really help you stay engaged in that moment. Feels a little bit different. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we all have had that moment of where you've been in the car 15 minutes Oh yeah, and you're, you're, you're pulling into your kid's school or work and you're like, Oh, how, how did I, get, I here? get here? Yeah. It's scary. <laughs> yeah, it is scary. Right? Like, how, how am I allowed out on the road? Right. I don't even know how the hell I got well, here. Well, that happens in sport a lot, right? Where, where you right. over prepare almost. And, and, and it, go, it happens a lot in golf because pre-shot routine is sort of this big idea and, and we're trying to mm. create some, um, 
consistency. So everything feels normal. Um, every yeah. shot's the same. You know, if you do the same thing every time before each shot, well, you miss a lot of important information if you do that, in my opinion. And it's interesting too, because like I have to imagine, like there's there's certainly the benefit of like muscle memory, like you know, so that, that yeah, it's, but that's it's a just different. In, that's different, right? And now I'm thinking about it too. It's like if you've, to your point, over prepared so much, where like every time you practice this shot, there's the same type of inputs. Yep. When you get thrown a new input, maybe it's like the leaderboard, or yeah. it's a, a bad shot the shot before. It's like you're almost not well equipped to deal with this new distraction right. because you've been doing everything in a box. In, in golf, instruction in, in skill development is, is steeped in consistency, right? Like you do the same thing over and yeah. over and over again. Yet, when you compete, you never hit the same shot twice. Right. Every shot is different. In, in fact, right. you can go across your life. You're never going to hit the same. Something's going to be a little bit different. Yeah. So it, it's strange in that, and again, the skill development piece is important. You need repetition to develop, like you said, yeah. muscle memory. But there's a difference between skill acquisition and then playing golf. Those are two different activities. Yeah. No, that's that's very true. And God, I feel that I mean, like like everything. Golf is such just like a good. Yeah, it is. There's uh, a lot of parallels to life and other. other yeah. Stuff. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You took the words right out of my <laughs> mouth. Um, so when you're working with these these pro golfers, you know, like you, we talked about how you'll have you know consultations over the phone, over Skype. Mm -hmm. Um, are you spending time with these guys like out on the course? Yeah, so that's, that's where the best or at tournaments? Yeah, that's where the yeah, best I'd, lo I'd love to hear what that's like. So when I go out to events, it's usually Sunday or Monday through Thursday, uh, during practice mm -hmm. rounds. Right. And there's a social piece to that. There's, there's talking to these guys and getting, you know, into their lives and what they do. And, and for them, it's sort of creating this sort of team, you know, where they feel comfortable. Uh, because yeah. there's a lot of distractions and it gets a little crazy. And then, yeah, getting on the golf course and talking just like we are now. No mm. script, but things come up, right, as they're com uh, playing practice rounds. We talk about different scenarios and things that are going on at home maybe or uh, yeah. in other areas of their lives. And, and that's, that's, that's the best work. It's, it's in that moment. It's real. It's right. what's happening in that moment. And, and golf is um, – it's nice in that you can't go on the ice with – the guys I work with that play hockey, like, you know, you can get in on the course while they're competing, right. not, not while they're competing, but, um, at least in practice yeah. rounds while they're playing and practicing. And it's great. It's, it's a really nice environment to do that kind of work. Yeah. And I, I have to imagine like, it's invaluable having a performance coach right there to get real time feedback. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you can never really kind of capture like what you were feeling on one right. shot if you're trying to catch up right after you know after a round or days later but like to have you there in the moment that's a good point yeah that's exactly right it, it's and again we i get you get reports from guys maybe after rounds and stuff but it's not the same it, it, it yeah. being there in that moment and, and again those practice rounds don't really replicate competition but it, at least it's it's a time to to talk about things that are that are happening in that moment for sure yeah what what percentage would you say of you know uh, tour golfers, guys on the tour are, are working with performance coaches. Is this something that's like now well, ad well adopted and, and felt to almost be like a needed tool in your toolkit? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very popular. I, I would say, man, 90% guys have somebody mm -hmm. that they, that yeah. they work with. Um, it, not just us. And then there's a fitness coach and there's a swing coach and maybe a chiropractor. I mean, there's a lot of different parts of the team now, but this team approach yeah. I think is, is gaining in popularity just to create some comfort, right? Mm -hmm. As best you can and some consistency, right? Getting guys getting a consistent message. So, um, but yeah. yeah, it's quite, it's quite popular for sure. Yeah. I, I have to imagine. So I, I could see how it'd be tremendously valuable. Do you, does your practice, um, do you do any work with like, uh, people who are working in like the private sector? Um, in terms of, like, just like corporate or they corporate, don't, you know what I mean? Sure. Like, are, are you, are you focused specifically on, you know, working in like professional golf? No, 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 not by, it, it just sort of worked out that way. Um, ah, okay. so I, I hadn't, I didn't set out to be a golf sports psychologist. It just sort of worked out that way and I enjoy it. No. Um, but I actually, I work for another startup, a company that, um, has brought sort of sports psych and performance work to the corporate world. Um, oh, very cool. What, what's that it's called, called? Valor Performance. It's Bauer Performance. Uh, Valor. Okay. Yeah. It's Valor. Oh, yeah. sorry. I'll make sure we, we link to yeah, it. Yeah. I'll, it's I'll check it's with based you here in Boston and, um, 
so the woman that started it, she's fantastic and she was an athlete and had a great experience with sports psychologist and, um, you know, went to business school and wanted to bring this to the corporate world. And, and so, uh, that's what we do and it's all done online and we work with different corporations and have sessions over the computer and, uh, we bring the same type of work to that field as well. And it's all the same stuff. It's easy Very for cool. me, uh, not easy, but in, in, the transition is it's all the same stuff. It's basically what I'm trying to say. It, it's no, yeah. It's the same approach. It's people get the same type of result from that from that type of work. No, that's great. That's great. So you know what what are you kind of interested in right now more broadly? Um, you know, certainly we we can talk about you know as it pertains to sports psychology, but um, is there anything that is has kind of grabbed your interest in recent that you're thinking about pulling into your practice? Um. That's a really good question. And, and the more and more I go along, uh, the more I realize how important this idea of self-compassion is too. And this, this is something we didn't really get into, but this uh, idea of um, the need to be kind to yourself. Yeah. And without it, we're sort of lost. And, and it's, mm-hmm. what's interesting is that uh, self-compassion, being kind to yourself isn't, a big part of athletic culture, right? Like you're right. told, like you gotta, you need to demand more from yourself. You have to be hard on yourself, and that's how you're going to motivate yourself. There's a lot of there's a lot of coaches who aren't kind to, to right. their so own players. Right. You know what I coaches, mean? Right? Exactly. So yeah, um, yeah. But there's so much research out now on this idea of uh, if you can support yourself, nothing is so frightening. Mm-hmm. Meaning, if I know that. Um, if I shoot 60 or I shoot 80, I'm going to treat myself the same way. Mm. Now there's no fear of what could go wrong, right? You start to chip away at this idea of, Hey, I'm going to be okay because golfers or athletes or anybody, they're not so much afraid of the result. They're afraid of what it's going to feel like to achieve a certain result. The fear, it's all fear based. And when we sense fear, we do all we can to avoid the fear or avoid the future that hasn't happened yet. And now we're avoiding instead of playing. Yeah. I heard recently someone, someone put it to me really well. They said it, 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 it's important to understand the difference between, you know, your value as an individual, as a person, Mm -hmm. right. Is not directly correlated to the outcome of, you know, if we're talking about sport, a competition, right. Right. So if, if you're a 10 on the scale of like, you know, your, your value as a person, right. If you go out and you have a terrible game and let's say it's a three on a scale, it's like you're not a three, no, right. right. Your value is unchanged. You just, the reality is you just had a bad yeah. game. Yeah. Try telling that to athletes that play at the <laughs> highest level, right. Their identity oh, is yeah. so tied <laughs> into it. Not only that. I can't, e- I can't even imagine. The, yeah. They're treated differently if they play well by others, yeah. not just themselves. Right. And, and it because yeah. it's, it's a tough, Tough go. The other really uh, interesting sort of idea, not, it's not very, not, it's been around for a while, this idea that um, as athletes, we've always assumed, or in any in corporate world as well, that we need to wait to be happy till we achieve something. Mm-hmm. Right? Like if I win that tournament, then I'll be happy. Right. And, and I, I'm of the belief that as we uh, pursue fulfillment, achievement gets in the way. Meaning if Mm. we find ways to be happy first, then the result doesn't matter as much. Yeah. Then we usually succeed. Yeah. There's a great book called dark horse. Uh, okay. Hold on. Uh, I got it right here. And it just says that I can hold it up. Yeah. Achieving success through the pursuit of fulfillment. Yeah. And I feel like talk about a tough sell, but this idea that, if we find ways to be engaged and fulfilled on our journey, that yeah. success undoubtedly is going to happen. Right. We just assume that we need to, and this is why people are, are miserable. I'm going to work my ass off until I'm 60 or 65, then retire. And then I'll be happy then. Right. Right. So now we're miserable our whole lives. Then we retire. Yep. Okay. Where's the happiness? Right. Right. Feels good for a couple of days. And then, well, this isn't what brought me happiness. I've wasted my whole life. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I, I had John Wooden's book up on my library yep. shelf and I'm on paternity leave right now. And 
there's a lot of early mornings spent with an infant. So yeah, yeah. I, just, I grabbed it <laughs> off the shelf. And I mean, he basically, you know, in his own way said the exact same thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, the outcome is just a byproduct of all the work that you do along the way. And, right. and what you really should be doing, right, is like enjoying and getting fulfillment from all the work, from the journey. Yeah, the journey, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It gets, I love that. it's a hard sell also, but this idea that the reason we feel happy when we achieve something temporarily is because we're not searching for a new, another achievement in that moment. Right. And it's why it doesn't right. last. Because yeah. then once we start searching again, it, th that happiness is gone. Right. So for someone who's an elite sports performance coach, right, how do you approach learning? Like, like where, where are you going to kind of, I mean, you've already, you know, mentioned multiple books, yeah. um, but like, how, how are you approaching your own kind of continued education and sure. growth? Yeah. I mean, I learn a lot from peers and going to different yeah. talks and, and I read a lot. Um, and I listen to what hmm. people are asking for clients. Yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, and, and I'm, I wouldn't say I'm constantly evolving, but I guess I am in terms of what's important to me and what I feel like, uh, is important to, I, I'm not as concerned with helping athletes play well as much as I am as helping them find fulfillment because I know hmm. that if we can do that, the good things will happen. Yeah. So the process is maybe a little bit longer. There's no quick fixes. Yeah. You know, you can have a good, how, how, how receptive are your elite athletes to that? Uh, Cause I got them at to your point, right? They're like, I just need you to clear this shit up yeah, so I can win yeah, this, this and tournament. And some are receptive to it and others aren't so much. And yeah. that's where you have the conversation that I don't know if I can help you. Right. I, like, look, Paul Azinger, who's an announcer, um, played professionally and major winner. Anyways, he, he said during the U S open coverage today that golfers are usually just a good conversation away from turning things around. And he's right. And I thought that was genius. So that's true, but it doesn't always work that way. Right? Yeah. It's building the sort of blocks along the way. Um, the more longer term relationships that I think are, are most important, but th there is some thing to that, that sometimes we're just a good conversation away from turning things around. Yeah. I love that. Well, so for, for people who want to learn more about you, yeah, right. Where, where, where should we direct them? Where can they find sure. you? Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at GC three, Greg. I, I don't post a whole lot of stuff, um, but I'm getting there. You're, you're too busy helping. Yeah, no, I guess. I don't know. And then I have a website <laughs> called mindfulmindset.com that mm -hmm. just has my information and a couple of old things on there, but I'm trying to revamp that uh, in the future. And, um, I'm writing a book uh, right oh, now, great. which, um, I don't have a whole lot of information to, uh, to share yet, but, uh, writing a book with a friend of mine that's, uh, I'm really excited about. Um, it, it's going awesome. to be more of a collection of stories and conversations. Oh, cool. So, well, yeah, please, please let me know, yeah. uh, you know, when you're getting ready to launch that. I, would, I'd love I will to, for sure. One, read it and two, help you yeah, promote it. Yeah, thanks a lot. That great. I will for sure. And then, um, and, you know, did I see that you're also now the performance columnist for golf.com? Uh, yeah. And golf. Yeah. In uh, golf magazine. Sorry. Uh, yes. Golf magazine, golf.com. I, uh, have a monthly column on there where I answer reader submitted questions, which is actually pretty cool. It's responding yeah. to what people want to hear, uh, instead of writing what I think people want to hear. So, right. Been, no, been I was looking at that and I thought, I thought that was great. Yeah. So that's, a, that's another great place. Maybe people yeah, can get in totally. Touch yeah. Thanks. Them. Especially, especially if they're golfing. Yeah. And it's funny. It's cause all the questions are, if you're a golfer, you, you, you felt, one of those questions before we all have the same questions. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's been fun. That's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks Greg. I, I really appreciate having you on. Yeah. Thank you. This was great. I, I appreciate you having me on and uh, enjoy talking. Then mommy. You better go ask mommy, daddy. <laughs> All right, and here we are again with uh, the fan favorite where I run it by my wife. Hello, Miss Lady. <laughs> Hi, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, man, that was such a good conversation. Yeah, he was awesome. I'm like still fired up about it. Um, <laughs> no, you are. I know. I'm just so, it was just so good. So when I was sitting and listening to it back, 
trying to take notes on like what I thought the big takeaways were. Like my list just kept growing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I felt like there was just so many things that were important um, and that like if you could just try and like, you know, integrate it and try and implement it into your life would be such a big help. Now, you're not a professional golfer, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> Did you take much away from this conversation? Uh, I think probably the biggest thing, and it's kind of a common thing, mm. theme on all of the podcasts you've done so far, but there's just no quick fix for it's things. so funny you say that because I have that written and starred on the back page. That's right. I think, I think he said those um, words exactly. There are no quick fixes. Yeah. It's more of like a lifestyle change and a conscious effort you're making. Yeah. But and that's I, like with everything though. Yeah. Right. It really is. And I feel like when you talk to people who either are doing something, you know, at like what we consider to be like the elite level or people who are like working and training people at the elite level, like they all say the same thing. Yeah. It's like, there's no quick fixes. Like it's hard for everyone, you know, and it like takes time and consistency, which I always say, and people are probably sick of hearing, but yeah, no quick fixes. Yep. Yeah. So one thing that he said, well, a couple of things that he said, but the, the first thing that he said was, you know, you can't control what you think, right? Which I think is something that we've incorrectly probably been taught our whole lives. You know, like mm -hmm. we even try and tell our kids like think positive and there's value in that. And there's a reason we tell them that. But like quite literally, for whatever reason, people can't stop the thoughts that kind of like flood into their head, you yeah. know? Yeah, it's, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And it seemed like it's more about you need to be able to come to terms with the fact that those thoughts are going to exist and not let them distract you from what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you do that well? No, mm. no. I think that a lot of people don't do that well. Yeah. No, I definitely don't try to, uh, but I don't. And then the next big point was this idea of, you know, and it's only three words, but there's so much that goes into it. This idea of like resistance causes tension, right? So resistance can mean multiple things, but when it pertains to thought, it's like when you have a bad thought flood your head and you're trying to do something, it could be a shot on the PGA tour. It could be prepare for a speech. It could be any number of things, right? When you have these bad thoughts, you start going through this whole process of like, oh, I got to get this thought out of my head. Or it's like, oh, this thought is like causing fear and anxiety because I'm afraid of failure. But like what that's really doing is it's, it, you're starting to have like resistance. And oftentimes it sounds like what you're having resistance to is something that hasn't even happened yet. So it's like, it's so weird that our minds do this because it, it can't be a good thing for us. But just these thoughts create this resistance that, that then in turn creates this tension. And that's actually ironically what causes us to underperform. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I thought that was super interesting. Um, the other thing that he said when I was like, you know, Hey, can I just start doing some, some breathing exercises and, and get my mind right? He was like, ah, maybe <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't know. He's like, they might work. They work for some people. Right. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not that you get rid of this anxiety. It's that you inevitably need to be able to come to terms with it. Yeah. I thought that was really like a cool way of thinking about it. I know. He like put me in like a Vulcan mind meld at one point. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Oh God. I don't even know how this marriage works sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, you know, he said something basically to the effect of like, look, the first step, right, if, if it is an ev even is a series of steps, is like you need to begin to acknowledge when you're becoming distracted, right? Like the big, the big thing is like we need to be more present, but to become present, you actually need to start acknowledging when you're not, yeah. when you're not being present. Yeah. Vulcan mind melt. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, like I actually like meditation. We've tried it a little bit. Yeah. I, I would like it more if we were on vacation and I wasn't worried about children. The baby in the background? Yeah. It's funny. This is a two-person session, but it always quickly becomes a third a third person in yeah. the room. Um, I think every time I've tried it with you, it's been helpful and I've liked it. Yeah. But it's just hard, especially with an infant. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and I think though he said something that was kind of profound in that like meditation does not have to be something where it's like you're Life looking to achieve. And yeah, you're. Yeah. It's like meditation is really being conscious about the thoughts that you're kind of processing and acknowledging them. And you can do that at any point in the day, you know? Mm. Yeah. So that kind of made me go, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. So I thought that was, I thought that was a really important takeaway. I mean, honestly, it's like to break this down, I almost want to tell people to listen to it again, you know? Yeah. Even having the conversation with them, listening to it back, I was like, oh man, that's a really great way to think about it. And I think the thing that I appreciate too is he's like, look, this is not the answer for everyone, right? It's Mm -hmm. like another perspective that you can take kind of in your own journey to dealing with the mess that is our own head. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Why are you laughing? No, it's true. Everyone's different and the approach that works for you probably wouldn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) He was great. So those were the big ones I had. So it's, you know, you, you can't control what you think, right? So get out of your own head in the sense that like the way the thoughts that you have are wrong, right? Even the top golfers in the world have negative thoughts. They're dealing with the exact same challenges we are. Uh, and it's that resistance that comes from these trying to fight these thoughts that cause the tension that inevitably cause you to underperform. Um, but he didn't really give a solution for how you do that. For which piece? Getting out of your own head. Yeah. But that's the thing. I think there like, there is no like quick fix. Like we said, I think it's that what you need to do is. Oh boy, we might have to call him back. What Mm -hmm. you have to do is like acknowledge the fact that you're having those thoughts, right? And then realize that those thoughts really have no power unless you begin to resist them. And then those thoughts cause you you anxiety, which then causes you to like tense up. So I think what he was trying to say too was like, by going through this, you know, meditative practice, as, as he kind of refers to it of like, acknowledging the fact that these thoughts are happening, acknowledge that they're causing anxiety. Eventually you can kind of become to terms with the fact that they're there, but they really don't have any power. I feel like, you know, I'm not that anxious, but I do get anxiety that like, I'm not doing enough. Like, Oh, I have all these goals and things that I want to accomplish. Oh, I know you do. (laughs) Yeah, I know you do. (laughs) And they're in the, but it's like, I'm getting anxious about something in the future that hasn't even happened yet. Yeah. Or a goal that hasn't been achieved in the future and it's it's affecting my now. Yeah. That was deep. This is a deep, deep show. Yeah. <laughs> that is deep as a puddle. <laughs> so I don't know. I thought I thought that was awesome. Um and he he listed some really good books. So I'm gonna link to those. I'm gonna try and read a couple of them myself because I haven't read those. But uh, you know, if he thinks they're worthwhile, then I'm in. <laughs> So that was good. Anything else? Anything else you want to wrap up with? <laughs> You're going to let me wrap up? Yeah. Any pressing <laughs> thoughts? No, I thought it was really good. He was really fun to listen to. You could tell he really loves what he does and mm-hmm. it, that makes people more interesting. Yeah. No, you're right. That, that really did come through. Yeah. Yeah. It was certainly a passion for him. Yeah, definitely. How are you sleeping? How's it going with the baby? <laughs> well, we're getting there. It's a work in progress. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm sleeping fine. <laughs> you, however, now we're getting there. Um, we'll keep we'll keep people abreast of how our child's sleeping over the course of this show. But uh, all right, well, we've got a really good, exciting guest next week. Um, so yeah, I can't wait to keep this thing going. Who's next week's guest, Kenny? I got to figure that out, Sonia. <laughs> okay. I just realized I don't know. Um, all right, well, let's wrap this up. I think that was a really good show. <laughs> All right. See you later. All right. See you later or in about five (laughs) minutes downstairs. All right. Bye. Bye.